Hi, it's Chris Flanagan. Welcome to the Pediatric Emergencies Podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about difficult vascular access in the peri-arrest patient. So the idea for today's episode came about based on an email I received from one of the podcast subscribers. They work in a district general hospital with very limited pediatric support, and they recently had a very difficult case. They had an infant presenting in a peri-arrest state, and vascular access was incredibly difficult at every attempt. Unfortunately, that child didn't survive, and following this, they were looking for any tips or pearls that I could give them on how they could manage that situation should the same thing happen. So what I'm planning to do in this episode is I'm going to talk through the various options you have for gaining vascular access, the pros and cons for each of them, and try and give some pearls for each of them along the way. So the first question that comes to me is whether we should actually try for peripheral vascular access in this child at all, or whether we should go straight for an IO. Now, if you picture this child, they're around about six months old, um, generally an age where you don't have good veins anyway, but they're shocked, they're peri-arrest, and if you've managed any of these kids before, you will know that vascular access is incredibly difficult, as it was in real life. And the chances of you actually succeeding are incredibly low. So really, should you be wasting time with a technique that is more likely to fail, or should you go with an IO, a technique which is much more likely to succeed right from the start and get on with resuscitating that child? So I think you have a couple of options here. The first option, and probably what I would recommend in this scenario, is say, go straight for an IO. You would, have a, you would eyeball the child and you would say, actually, there's nothing that looks good. Get on with an IO and we'll get on with resuscitating the child. We can maybe have a look for a peripheral line later on if we need an extra line, but we're going to start with an IO. The other option would be you could spend a short amount of time, maybe a minute, have a couple of goes at trying to get a peripheral line in, but very quickly move on to an IO if that fails. So a couple of pointers about the peripheral venous access. I think the first thing would be, this is going to be incredibly difficult, so somebody who has recent experience of candulating children would probably be the most likely to succeed, so it would make sense for them to have those few first attempts. The second thing I would say is don't forget about the places paediatricians will think about, and that is the scalp veins. In general, quite often, a lot of the other veins are really shut down, where the child may have big distended veins on the scalp, and that's going to be the first thing that the paediatrician is going to come along and put a cannula into. So just don't forget about it. If you're used to looking after only adults, you won't think of scalp veins. So remember them in children. They can get you out of a lot of trouble. Okay, so let's say we haven't been successful at getting a peripheral line in, or we've gone straight for an IO from the start, and that's probably going to be my preferred approach. And the IO line is an incredible line. Um, It is the quickest route that you have to getting fluids and medications into the central circulation. And it is a much better line than a peripheral cannula in the back of the hand. And that is something that I need to state because people do regard it as a second class line. There's an absolutely brilliant video. I think it was Larry Mellick who put this video up on YouTube. And they have a cadaver. Um, they have dissected down to the vasculature in the subclavian vein. And they have a humeral IO. So this is obviously somebody who's been dead for some time. And they inject a fluid bolus through the IO. And within a matter of seconds, you can see the subclavian vein becoming engorged. So absolutely incredible. If you think you're getting this response in a cadaver, in a real patient, it's your drugs that you give via the IO are very quickly into the central circulation. So it's an incredibly good line. And if you're not currently using it in these scenarios, you need to think about using them. So in terms of looking at the pros and cons of IOs, insertion is incredibly easy. There's a very high success rate. You've got quick passage of any fluids or medications into the central circulation. And you can use the IO line to administer infusions, things like adrenaline and other medications that are going to be very useful for keeping this particular child alive. So obviously there are some limitations to the IO line. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making this podcast. I would just say put the IO in and the job is done. It's not that simple. Um, There's a few limitations. I think there's two minor ones and one major one. The two minor ones, first of all, you've only got one port on the IO line, so you can only administer one medication or fluid at once. 
And generally in these sick, critically ill children, you're going to need multiple ports of access. You can, of course, put two in. Um, and again, quite often that's what we are doing in these sicker children, are going and getting started with an IO and then getting a peripheral cannula at a later stage. The other big issue is the sampling. You've got this really sick patient, there's a whole load of investigations you want to send, and the IO isn't really going to cut it from that point of view. The other thing is you're quite frequently going to want to do blood gases to assess the response of the child to the interventions that you're doing. So the IO isn't going to allow you to do that either. They're the minor things. I think the biggest thing is that IOs fail. So unfortunately, this can be a fairly common event. And certainly over the last year, I can think of a number of children that have arrived in the ICU where an IO has failed and they've swollen them from that. Um, the simple answer is put another one in if one fails. But again, I can think of numerous occurrences where multiple IOs have failed and they've had to go for another type of access. So you are going to have to have a plan. The IOs don't always work and you're going to have to have another plan of what you're going to go to should it fail. So what would I do if I was standing beside this child now? And the simple answer is I would put in an external jugular line. So that's a normal cannula inserted into the external jugular vein. So this is really straightforward to do if you know what you're doing. And quite often we'll be called down to these patients and everybody is poking at the child in the backs of the hands, the backs of the feet, going for these little small veins with small cannula. I'll take one look at the bulging vein in the neck and stick a big cannula into it, hand somebody 10 mils of blood that came straight out of the cannula without any difficulty. So your gases and all your blood tests are away. And then you've got good, reliable access to give any drugs and take blood samples at a later stage. And that's really important. This is a really good line for sampling as well as giving drugs into. So you're getting yourself a bit more for an IO. And in fact, inserting it is just as quick as putting an IO in as long as you know what you're doing. So knowing what you're doing is very important. Um, and I'll give you a quick crash course on how to put these lines in. So the first thing is, what side do you go for? In general, I would recommend going for the left-hand side, and the reason for that is that is leaving the right-hand side of the neck free for the central line. So in general, we much prefer putting central lines into the right internal jugular vein rather than the left. The left has quite a tortuous course. There's two big turns in it, and the lines are much more likely to go the wrong way or have much more complications from the lines if they're inserted on the left side of a child. So if you've got a patient with two good external jugular veins, I would recommend going for the left. If you've only got a good one on the right, by all means, go for it. But it's just if you have a choice, go for the left if possible. The next thing is how do you position the patient? So there's a few important steps. The first is you're going to want to have the patient slightly head down. Um, that's going to fill the veins and reduce any risk of an air embolus. The next thing you're going to want to do is get the neck extended. Um, there's two ways to do that. If you've got time and it's available, you can put a roll under the patient's shoulders and turn their head to the opposite side. Um, it depends how acute the scenario is. You don't want to be waiting about for that. So I'll quite often get somebody just to put their arm under the child's shoulders and put their other hand under the chin, bringing the head over to the other side. It's only going to take you a matter of seconds to put this line in. So I don't see the point of waiting 30 seconds for a roll to appear. In these acute scenarios, somebody's arm under the shoulder is going to work perfectly well. What I tend to do with my left hand, I'll put my left index finger over the tip of the vein to help it become distended. I'll then use my thumb slightly further back towards me and out to the left hand side to stretch the skin, sort of pinning the vein in place. And then you need another assistant over the other side, just opposite your thumb, stretching the other way. And that just fixes the vein and prevents it moving when you're cannulating it. In terms of the type of cannula that you put in, it's just a normal intravenous cannula, although the diameter and the length are important. Generally, this is quite a large vein. So in a little infant, I would be putting normally a 22 gauge cannula into the vein. Um, you can, of course, put a 24 gauge in if that's what you're used to. But from a point of view of giving the medications quicker and sampling the 22 gauge tends to be perfect for these children under about a year. You might look at the vein and go, this is absolutely massive. I can put a 20 gauge cannula into this. I probably would stay away from it in a child of this age. And the big problem with that is the 20 gauge cannula tends to be a little bit longer than the 22 gauge. And it is going to go into the vein that little bit further. 
You might think, what's the problem with that? Well, there's a very steep turn in the vein where it joins the subclavian vein. And it's almost a right angle. And if your cannula is either going round that or sitting up against the wall of the subclavian vein, it's not going to work very well for sampling or administering your drugs. And actually, you're better than slightly further back, leaving the tip of the cannula in the external jugular vein. In terms of cannulating it, there is two main problems. The first is this vein is incredibly superficial. So you will have actually have gone through it before you realized. And the other big problem is getting your cannula flat enough to the patient to cannulate it superficially is quite tricky as well because their head and chin is going to get in the way even if somebody has moved it over to the other side and you've used a roll trying to extend the neck. So these small babies, as you know, don't have very big necks and this makes this procedure even more difficult. The other big problem with these veins because of their location and the effects of respiration on them, you may actually have a negative pressure in the veins, particularly if your patient's breathing spontaneously. And um, we've already mentioned the risk of our embolus, hence why you're gonna position the patient in a head down position. The other problem you might get is you may not get a flashback if you just cannulate the vein. It may feel like you've gone in, um, but there'll be no blood coming into the cannula like you would normally expect. And if you keep going, you'll end up through the other side. So when you put all this together, um, my preferred technique for cannulating the external jugular vein is to just transfix it. If you try and cannulate it, more likely than not, you're going to fail. You're going to end up going through it anyway. So you've got two options. If you do want to try and cannulate it directly, what I would recommend doing is putting a syringe on the end of the cannula and aspirating continuously. And certainly this would be what I would do if this was a bigger child. When you've got blood coming into your syringe, you simply push the cannula off the needle and into the vein. Downside of this is once you add a syringe onto the back of the cannula, it's even more difficult to get it fitted in onto the patient's chin and get it flat enough that's going to allow you to cannulate it rather than transfix it. In the small baby, if you do want to try and cannulate it, that's fine, have a go at it. But if you're going to miss, make sure you miss on the longer side. So either you're going to, you're going to cannulate it or you're going to go through it. Because if you've gone through it, you've got a chance of recovering it. If you miss it too short, um, the biggest problem with these veins is you get one go at cannulating it. One go at puncturing it. If you pull your cannula out the other end, you will not get another go at trying to cannula it. So they're one shot only, and you have to make that shot your best one. And for me, that is why I would recommend transfixing them. So what I would do is try and go as shallow as I can, go straight through the back of it. Then what I would do is take the needle out of the cannula and put a two mil syringe onto the end of the cannula. I'm going to aspirate out really, really slowly, constantly under negative pressure as I withdraw the cannula. The moment you've got blood coming into the cannula, I would just advance it into the vein and then aspirate again to confirm it's in the right place. So four times out of five, the cannula will just push into the vein nicely. If it doesn't, what I would do is continue to aspirate, and you'll probably find it stopped aspirating freely at this stage, and you might need to withdraw it back a few more millimeters until you're getting blood freely coming into your syringe. So at that stage, you need to have a guide wire prepared and ready at hand. Um, and what you would do is pass the guide wire down the cannula and then pass the cannula into the vessel. The type of guide wire is important as well. Um, what I would recommend is one that has a straight tip on it, so not a J-wire. The J-wire is going to be absolutely useless for you in this scenario. And one that is nice and flexible. There's some of the kits that come with a really hard wire on it. This is not what you want. Um, Vigon make a really nice straight wire with a soft, flexible tip, and it's absolutely perfect for doing this. I would try and avoid the temptation of you get these midlines again, the likes of uh, later flex lines, they come in six or eight centimeters. You may be thinking, why don't I just pass one of these over the wire when I've got it in? As I already mentioned, even with a soft flexible wire, it's really hard to get it go around that right angle at the subclavian, and you're really going to ask for trouble by trying to do it. It is possible, but it's generally a five, 10 minute job while you're filling your wire around these corners. So it's not what you want in this child. You want access and sampling as quickly as possible. So it's a short fat cannula in the vein is what you want. So I've got two final points when it comes to external jugulars. 
The first is whether you should be trying to put this in. And I've certainly chatted through this with a few of my colleagues. Some of them are pretty proactive about us teaching you about this option. Others would actually discourage it. Because when we come down, if you've actually tried both external jugglers, as I've mentioned, you tend to only get one go at them. Um, we're a bit stuck in that scenario and we're going to have to move on to something else. Whereas an experienced pair of hands would probably have got that line in. So I think it depends in the particular scenario that you're in. If you know you've got a very experienced pair of hands that is a minute away, probably wrecking that very good external jugular is probably not the way to go. If you if that very experienced pair of hands is maybe an hour away in the tertiary hospital, then by all means you have nothing to lose by trying it. And I would recommend that that's what you do. So how do you learn to do this? And you cannot simply listen to my description of how to do this in a podcast and then go off and start sticking cannulas into children's necks. That is certainly not what I am advising. But what I think you should do is go and find somebody who does this on a regular basis and try and get yourself slotted in somewhere where you can learn to do it. The places that you're likely going to be able to do that are either going to be a theatre or intensive care. Um, or whenever you've got another critically ill patient who is actually reasonably stable, it might be a child who's been intubated for seizures, you've maybe done it with an IO, and then the anaesthetist is actually, there's nowhere else to put a line, I'm going to put an external jugular in. That's a good one to do. So the next time the emergency comes up, you're going to be able to actually do it. Alternatively, you may well find yourself in a scenario one day where you can't get peripheral access, you can't get IO access, and your back is really against the wall. You've got this child who's going to die unless you get access and give them the fluids and the drugs that they need. So you may well have to weigh up the risks and benefits of going ahead and actually learning to do this procedure on a critically ill child. Because if you don't get the line in, they're going to die, so you've got nothing to lose by having a go at it. But you're going to have to make that judgment call yourself, weighing up the risks and benefits. And that's the reason I have put these tips into this podcast, because somewhere somewhere along the lines, they may well save a child's life. The final downside I want to mention about external jugular lines is that if you're having interventions up around about the airway, they are not the best line to be putting in. Um, obviously, you have to position the child in a certain way to get access to the neck to put them in. So if somebody is instrumenting the airway or doing procedures up around that, they're not an option to start with, which is why I've mentioned for this particular child that's coming in, I would start off with uh, an IO, and once the airway has been sorted out, this would be a line that I would probably go to next if we needed the access urgently. If we didn't, and time allowed, I would probably move towards central access. So just before I come on to talk about central access, some of you may well be wondering about ultrasound-guided peripheral access, and I would say this is not a good option for this particular case, and I'll explain my reasons for that. There's two big downsides to ultrasound-guided peripheral access. The first is it, it takes longer to do than either an interosseous or an external jugular line. The other big downside is that the failure rate is much higher. Had this been a bigger patient, you would have a much higher chance of success, although it's still going to be slower than the other two options. If you think in a little baby, the veins that you're going for with ultrasound are probably a millimetre in size. They're already shocked and shut down. The chances of you succeeding with these is going to be incredibly low. So starting with it, as far as I'm concerned, would not be a good approach. You should go either with your IO or your external jugular, both of which are much more likely to succeed and much more likely to be quicker. Okay, so it mightn't be any good to start with, but what about later on? So we'll start off with an IO or an external jugular, but later on, why shouldn't we put an ultrasound-guided peripheral line? And for this particular patient, again, I would say this is probably not a good option. So the patient I've got in front of me is peri-arrest. They're incredibly sick. They're heading to the intensive care unit. They're going to need frequent sampling. They're likely to need vasoactive drugs. So you haven't really solved an ongoing problem with your ultrasound-guided peripheral line. You've temporized the problem by providing a little bit more access, but Instead of you using your ultrasound guidance to put in a cannula into a small, tiny peripheral vein, why not use the same technique to put a much larger line into a central vein where you're going to be able to give more than one drug at once through the multiple lumens and to be able to sample reliably 
um, as often as you want and as frequently as you want. So for this particular child, I don't think it is a good option. For a more stable child, um, it certainly is something that is worth doing. Um, I think in the babies, you're still going to struggle because if the patient isn't that sick, they're going to be moving on you. And I find this a very hard technique. Even somebody who I've done thousands of lines with ultrasound. And I think if I was having to do this in a baby, I would struggle for a peripheral vein on a well baby who was moving about. Bigger child, definitely when you've put enough um, local anaesthetic cream and infiltrated a little bit of local, it's definitely a reasonable technique to do in that moderately sick group who isn't necessarily going to go to the ICU and isn't necessarily going to end up with a central line. But for our particular patient, it's inevitable they're going to end up with a central line, so you should get on and do that. So again, you're not going to be able to follow this podcast and go and start off putting central lines into children if you've never put central lines in before. This is certainly not the aim of it. The aim of this is to provide some tips and pearls to people who are skilled at putting central lines in to bigger patients and how they should modify their technique to succeed reliably in putting lines into children and particularly small babies. Because if you use the same technique that you use in adults, in the bigger patients, you'll probably not have any problem putting the lines in. The smaller, sicker patients, sometimes your lines will go in, sometimes they won't. Sometimes it'll take you three or four times to get your line in, which importantly is a a long amount of time. But if you follow the technique that I am going to tell you about, the majority of the time you should be able to get your line in on the first go without any difficulty. So previously I have done quite a long podcast explaining the reasoning for what I'm about to tell you. I think the whole thing is about an hour. You don't want to listen to me for about an hour here talking about this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a link to that podcast in the description. So you can go ahead if you want to find out more details about why I'm saying what I'm saying. um, You can go and listen to that podcast. So what I'm going to share here is just the key methods to succeed. So if you want to succeed at putting central lines into babies, there's two key tips that I can give you. The first is that you should use a cannula rather than a needle. And the second is you should not be trying to cannulate the vessel on ultrasound. You should be transfixing it. So I am recommending that all this is done with ultrasound guidance. So I would recommend that you go ahead and transfix the vessel with the cannula. At this stage, I would remove the needle and put the syringe onto the end of the cannula. You're going to put negative pressure on the syringe and withdraw the cannula millimetre by millimetre from the vessel. The moment you get free-flowing blood coming into your syringe, importantly it has to be free-flowing because you will get a little bit of blood if you have done a posterior wall puncture leaking out. Um, The moment it comes freely, you advance the cannula into the vessel and the rest of the line is exactly how you would do it in an adult or bigger patient. Those maybe one, one or two out of ten times it doesn't advance in, what you want to do is just withdraw it again to where it's aspirating freely and pass a guide wire down on. The other key tip I've got here is whatever you do, do not use a J-wire. You have to remember the central veins in a baby are really small in size. The femoral vessels may only be a couple of millimetres in size and the internal jugular may be only five millimetres in diameter. So these are really small targets that you're going for. And if you think if your cannula is half in and half out and you're trying to pass a J-wire down it, the chances are you will dislodge the cannula from the vessel. So what I would recommend is there's the Vigon kits come with a J-wire, but also a straight wire that has a soft, flexible tip. And that's what I would use. So what I cannot recommend doing, as you'll see some people recommend this, is actually put the J-wire in the opposite way round. This isn't safe to do. Um, The tip of that wire is not designed to go into the vessel. It is sharp and pointy and can perforate things. The straight wires that come in the central line kits have a soft, flexible tip and are designed not to perforate anything. So it's making sure you've got the right kit in advance. And I know if I'm with this child and I'm handed a J-wire, it's going to make my job much more difficult. If the cannula goes in, first go and stay into the vessel, no problem. But if the cannula's half in, half out, I know there's probably a one in three chance I'm going to lose the line at this stage if I use a J-wire 
So again, you've got two options here. You can take at face value the tips I've given you, put them into practice, and your success rate will just go up. The other thing you can do is go to the link to the podcast where I talk about central line insertion in children, and I'll explain the reasonings for why I have said you should do it this particular way. The other thing that you'll find useful is I have two videos of me inserting central lines into children. One is a bigger child, about a one-year-old, and in that I did not use the transfection technique. I simply put the cannula into the vessel and pushed the cannula off the needle. That was an absolutely massive vein that I didn't need to, to transfix. I have another one in a small neonate, and that one I did transfix. So if you're looking to see that technique in full, you'll see it in that video. And that is what I would recommend you use in these small, sick infants. The other thing that's important to mention is where should you put the central line. So in general, in kids, we don't tend to put subclavian lines in. Um, Your two main choices are internal, jugular, or femoral. So where I'm deciding where to put the line, there is a few important factors. My first choice for our particular patient would be a right-sided internal jugular line. And the reason is the internal jugulars are generally absolutely massive compared to the femorals. So your chances of success in a timely manner are much higher. And this child really needs the vascular access quickly so you can get on with managing them. The main situation where I would start off with the femoral line would be if the patient was currently having airway interventions done and you couldn't get up to the neck. Or if the airway hadn't already been secured and you decided that you wanted to go with a central line before securing the airway. In general, if you're positioning the patient, scrubbing them, and something goes wrong with it, you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing while the airway is managed. If you're down at the bottom half of the patient, you can have two different teams. You can keep going with your line while people are sorting out the airway. The other two common scenarios where you may well want to go with a femoral line rather than an internal jugular is if your patient's coagulopathic or if your patient has the type of congenital heart disease where they're going to go down the univentricular heart route and have a fontan in the future. And if you wreck their internal jugulars, you may limit the further surgery that they can do. So again, I'm not expecting you to listen to this podcast or the other podcasts where I talk about central line insertion in children and then have the box tech that you're skilled to do this in small children and get the lines in successfully. It's going to take more work than that. What I have hopefully done is shared a few pearls where you're likely to go wrong and how maybe you need to modify the technique that you're using in adults if you want to succeed on the first time and on a timely basis. So how do you put those skills into practice? And I think there's two main ways. The first would be to try and get yourself some time in a tertiary children's hospital, either in the operating theatre or in the paediatric intensive care unit. And we certainly in the past have had some general anaesthetists who deal mostly with adults come in and spend a little bit of time with us and getting some hands-on experience of doing those skills under our guidance as somebody who does them on a regular basis. The other way that you can actually improve your skills in inserting central lines in children is actually to put cannulas or midlines in adults using ultrasound. You may have an adult that you need to cannulate and there may well be superficial veins that you can see, but there's nothing stopping you getting the ultrasound out and go in for one of the slightly deeper veins, or even to cannulate those superficial veins with ultrasound. And importantly, the chances are those superficial veins that you are seeing are exactly the same size as the central veins of a neonate. So they're a perfect opportunity to, to practice those skills. What I would encourage you to do is to use the exact same technique that I've taught you with transfiction, trying to push the cannula then into the vessel. If it doesn't go having your guide wire to hand and then trying to feed the guide wire and then the cannula over the guide wire. And if you use that technique and become skilled in that technique, when you actually have to put that central line in a neonate's neck, it is going to be really, really straightforward because you're actually been practicing it on smaller veins. Okay, so that's my thoughts on difficult vascular access on the peri-arrest paediatric patient. So hopefully it's given you a bit of a structure on what lines to use when, and hopefully a few pearls for inserting them, so hopefully your success rate will go up if you follow them. I do recognise that there is limitations to what can be done via podcast. Hopefully it's going to give you a few pointers in the right direction, but I do appreciate that it's not going to solve the problem, and that you may well have to do some extra work. For example, if you're in the emergency department working, 
your best technique may well be to start putting some of your adult lines in with ultrasound so that you can use the same technique in kids and, and practicing some external jugulars in the bigger patients. If you're an adult anaesthetist, it may well be that actually you're going to maybe start putting some of your central lines in using the transfiction technique, even if you don't need to, and maybe try and get yourself a little bit of time in the tertiary children's hospital on a regular basis so that when this situation does arrive, you'll be prepared for it. So if you have any questions or queries or even any pearls of your own that you would like to share, what I'm going to do is put a post up on the Pediatric Emergencies website with this podcast on it. So that's pediatricemergencies.com with pediatric spelled the UK way with an A in it. So you can leave any questions, comments or pearls of your own there and I'll get back to you on them. Thanks for listening.